us in worship. Hopefully, you all have received the one handout for this evening, as well as next Sunday night. And, believe it or not, the last handout that you will receive for our study on the book of Job, which began in 1997. No, it began... <laughs> It began in October of last year, October of last year. The remaining schedule for us, Joe will lead us through the end of February. We'll address chapters 38, 39, 40, and 41 today, as well as next week. Then the last Sunday of this month, we'll cover chapter 42, which is just seven through the verses. In March, we'll go to the New Testament, and we'll look at 1 Peter. 1 Peter. Less homework when you get to 1 Peter, only five chapters compared to 42 chapters in Job. So... Believe it or not, you, you can read 1 Peter in one sitting in about 13 minutes from start to finish. So, see how y'all did it. What? Your study will last 10 minutes. I don't know. I don't know. But it, 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 we, we immediately start with the doctrine of election. Here's, here's my... Uh, Teacher's help here, Jerry. You've been fired, Jerry. The handouts have already been delivered. We actually had budget money, and we paid teacher aides today. Sorry, you got no money. Yeah, it's all spent. Finance committee met today, and uh, we we spent the money. No, that's not true. Don't. That's just a joke. I might start a controversy here. You better not. Why? Okay. Great. So. Wow. That, Rick, is that okay? I am I am hot. The mic that is. Yeah. <laughs> have to clarify. <laughs> Just my opinion. Well, I am warm up here too. I know. I know. My wife is hot natured, so she she'll say, I'm hot, and I'll say, well, stop bragging. <laughs> yeah, I can I can get away with that. I can say that about it. Charles Williams penned the following conversation between the Archdeacon and Mr. Mornington. Two characters in his novel, War in Heaven. I'm afraid, the Archdeacon said gloomily, this interest and what they call the occult is growing. It's a result of the lack of true religion in these days and a wrong curiosity. Oh, wrong, do you think? Mornington asked. Would you say any kind of curiosity was wrong? What about Job? Job, the archdeacon asked. Well, sir, I always understood that where Job scored over the three friends was in feeling a natural curiosity why all those unfortunate things happened to him. They simply put up with it, but he, so to speak, asked God what he thought he was doing. The archdeacon shook his head. He was told he couldn't understand he was taunted with not being able to understand, which is quite the same thing, Mornington answered. As a mere argument, there's something lacking, perhaps, in saying to a man who's lost his money and his house and his family and is sitting on the dustbin, boils all over him. Look at the hippopotamus. Mr. Mornington sarcastically referred to Yahweh's, which in your Bible is translated Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, 
and capital D, all caps. Did you notice whenever you have read the Old Testament that our English translations will distinguish between Yahweh and other names for God that can be translated Lord. As an example, even though you're not yet Hebrew scholars, not yet, you've heard Adonai. Have y'all heard Adonai? Anyone? Yes? Whenever Adonai appears in the Old Testament, the English translators will capitalize the L and O-R-D will be in lowercase. Not the case with Yahweh, that very special name. Whenever Yahweh appears, all caps, look at your Bible, your favorite Bible, and see if in chapter 38, verse 1, when you read, then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Lord, in my Bible, is capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. That is Yahweh in the Hebrew. Now you know more Hebrew than you realize. <clears throat> Mornington sarcastically referred to that second Yahweh speech, which begins in chapter 40 and verse 6 through chapter 41 and verse 34. We'll address that second Yahweh speech in better detail next week. Next week. So you still have time if you've not done the homework having read all of chapters 38 through 41. You still have time. Prior to Yahweh's speeches, which is how, which is how Old Testament scholars label if you're wanting that outline, which is how Old Testament scholars label chapter 38, 39, 40, and 41, the Yahweh speeches. Two speeches, because as you heard correctly, I used the word speech as a plural noun. Yahweh speeches. The first speech is chapter 38, verse 1, through chapter 40 and verse 2. Chapter 38, verse 1, to chapter 40, verse 2. You've got, hopefully, you picked up the handout today. This is all before you. You don't have to frantically write some of these statistics because the handout is available. If you didn't get the handout before, we have plenty of them. You can pick one up after. The first speech from chapter 38, verse 1, to chapter 40, verse 2, Job responds to that first speech of the Lord. Job's response is just three verses. Chapter 40, verses 3 through 5. The Lord speaks again, beginning in chapter 40, verse 6. That's the second Yahweh speech through chapter 41, verse 34. Job responds to the second speech of the Lord, chapter 42, verses 1 through 6. And then we have what is known as the epilogue, the final word. We have the prologue, chapters 1 and 2, and then we have an epilogue, which is the last 11 verses of the book, chapter 42, verses 7 through 17, which are prose, not poetry. Do you remember way back when I told you that the book has this unusual structure. It begins in prose, shifts to poetry, and then goes back to prose. Prose is chapters 1 and 2. Poetry is chapter 3, verse 1, to chapter 42, verse 6. So, the, so the, the chunk of this book is poetry, and then it concludes 11 verses, prose, chapter 42, verses 7 through 17. We'll deal with chapter 42 in greater detail on February 25th. Y'all, prior to the two speeches of Yahweh, did you know that God had spoken a total of five verses in the book? Five. And he only spoke to one individual. I refer to him as the adversary. 
you might prefer calling him <clears throat> Satan. Nevertheless, though God had not spoken, that did not discourage the human beings within the story. It actually heightened their anticipation for God speaking. Oh, would God speak? Eliphaz, as an example, anticipated God speaking. You don't have to turn there. Just listen to what Eliphaz said in chapter 22, verses 21 and 22. Chapter 22, verses 21 and 22. Eliphaz tells Job, Yield now and be at peace with God. Thereby good will come to you. Please receive instruction from his mouth and establish his words in your heart. Bildad anticipated God speaking. Listen to chapter 8. Chapter 8 and verse 5. Bildad tells Job, chapter 8, verse 5, If you would seek God and implore the compassion of of the Almighty. My least favorite character, Zophar, yes, he even anticipates God speaking. Listen to what Zophar says in chapter 11. Chapter 11, verses 5 and 6, Zophar says to Job, But would that God might speak and open his lips against you. Always the, the stab with the knife, the, the, the attack. And show you the secrets of wisdom, for sound wisdom has two sides. Know then that God forgets a part of your iniquity. Yes, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar are not alone. Elihu, that interesting character we covered last week, he anticipated God speaking. Listen to what Elihu states in chapter 37, verses 1 through 5. Elihu tells Job, At this also my heart trembles and leaps from its place. Chapter 37, verse 2. Listen closely to the thunder of his voice and the rumbling that goes out from his mouth. Verse 3. Under the whole heaven he lets it loose and is lightning to the ends of the earth. After it a voice roars. He thunders with his majestic voice and does not restrain the lightnings when his voice is heard. Verse 5, God thunders with his voice wondrously, doing great things which we cannot comprehend. Of course, you know, having been through this book, not just through our most recent study, but you've read this book before, that Job especially anticipates God speaking. Let me give you just one sample comes from chapter 9. comes from chapter 9. This is what Job says in chapter 9, verses 14, 15, and 16. Chapter 9, beginning in verse 14. How then can I answer God and choose my words before him? For though I were right, I could not answer. I would have to implore the mercy of my judge. If I called and he answered me, I could not believe that he was listening to my voice. Y'all, why did Job eagerly await God speaking? Two answers to my one question. Number one, Job wanted an explanation of his suffering. Job wanted an explanation of his suffering. Job already knew but he wanted to hear it from God's own mouth. Job knew that God was the cause of his own suffering. We'll get back to that in a moment. Second answer to the why question. Why did Job anticipate God speaking? Secondly, Job wanted a declaration of his innocence. And he would have embraced that declaration of 
his own innocence by God stating, I was wrong. Joe, I'm guilty. He hoped to hear God say, I'm sorry. And with the words, I'm sorry, Joe, you might be thinking that's, that's convoluted. I agree. By hearing the words, I'm sorry, Joe would have said, yes, I was right all along. I'm right. God is wrong. In fact, though I told you we'll look at the second speech next week, there is this statement that comes from the second speech that is relevant for now. It comes from chapter 40 and verse 8. Here's what God says to Job <coughs> in his second speech. God says, chapter 40, verse 8, Will you really annul my judgment? Will you condemn me that you might be justified? Do, do you see that? Everything is dependent upon God being guilty. The only way that Job thinks he can be declared right is by God himself admitting, I was wrong, Job. I mistreated you. So, as I said, Job wants an explanation of his suffering. Job wants a declaration of his innocence. Consider again in, in a little more detail Job wanting an explanation of his suffering. If you count the first monologue, that's chapter 3, then you have eight speeches by Job as responses to his friends. After which you have the second monologue, Job chapters 29, 30, 31. So that's 10 speeches in this book. Just think about that. 10 speeches of Job. Seven of the 10 times that Job spoke, God's omnipotence and God's omniscience were an issue. Were an issue. Job did not doubt those divine traits. Yeah. God is all-powerful. God is all-knowing. Job never doubted those divine traits. Job criticized how God as ruler used those traits. God, in essence, uh, for the sake of time, I won't go and read, but it's an, a sample. You can go to chapter 12 of the book of Job. That's just one of Job's speeches. And look at verses 13 to 25. Chapter 12, verses 13 to 25. And you see, as you read, accusation upon accusation, Job pointing his finger and saying, you abuse your position of authority. You take advantage of the innocent and the helpless and of course, he's the prime example of God abusing his position of authority. I'm a victim, Job says. I'm a victim of God's omnipotence and God's omniscience. Seven of the ten speeches features God's omniscience and God's omnipresence. And they're issues for Job makes him upset. For us, we thank God that he's omniscient. He's all-knowing. We thank God that he's omnipotent, that he's all-powerful. Not the way Job saw it. Y'all, of those ten speeches, four of the ten times that Job spoke, the prosperity of the wicked was an issue. The prosperity of the wicked they get away with it. And Job, 
he expresses, God is capable of deterring evil. He is. But he doesn't do anything. He's got the power and he's got the knowledge. And he fails to deal with rampant evil on this planet. And instead of dealing with rampant evil on this planet, Job would say, he's picking on me. And I'm innocent. I'm innocent. So Job is expecting, demanding, when God speaks, explanation of suffering, declaration of innocence. When you read the 126 verses of the two speeches of the Lord, you will discover that Job does not get anything that he wants. He doesn't. He wants an explanation of his suffering. God didn't get it. <clears throat> he wants a declaration of his innocence. He doesn't get it. In fact, when you look at the 126 verses, the combined two speeches of the Lord, did you know that the Lord does not address ever, not even in a portion of a verse, Job's suffering? Never talks about it. He doesn't even address the issue of suffering in general. That it's just a part of the human condition. I'm looking at a room full of folks that have had their fair share of suffering. That's, that's the one common denominator. It does not matter whether you're young or old, religious or irreligious, educated or unlearned, wealthy, or poor, or whatever your ethnicity. Suffering is the one common denominator of this life. And we know why. You just have to go back to Genesis 3. We messed up. I mean, none of this was God's idea. But we're, we're paying the price for the consequences of our own rebellion against God. And as I have acknowledged to the Lord, I've, I've said, Lord, I've made the sin problem worse. I haven't made it better. I've added to it. My sins were sufficient to send the Lord Jesus to the cross. And that sin's plural. I, I'm a problem. I, I'm part of the problem. And I needed a Savior as much as Adam and Eve did. Yes. So, what do you do when you think that the message of this book is suffering? What do you do when you get to chapter 38, 39, 40, and 41? The folks who insist that this book is about suffering collide with the Yahweh speeches. Y'all won't lie because I've been a good guy. I've, I've opened you to another possibility that though suffering is a theme, that this book is not merely about suffering. It's actually about something much bigger than human beings suffering. It's about God. This book is more about God than it is about Job, than it is about us. This book is about God's sovereignty. God being in charge. God being in control. Remember the two questions that I presented to you months ago. And I said, notice how the characters, the various characters, answer the two questions. The first question being, is God in control? And then the second question, a follow-up. If so, is God loving and just? When we looked at Job, He, the first to, uh, to respond among the human beings, the first to respond among the human beings, Job answers yes to both questions. He does. Even after round one of his suffering, he says, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. That's God's in charge. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Job worships 
That's yes to the second question. The Lord, as in charge, is loving and just. Something happens, however, in chapter 3. There's a shift in Job's attitude. He's, he has not changed his answer to the first question. He never does. God is in control. But he changes his answer to the second question. Is God loving and just? Answer, no. How can he be if I'm suffering like I am? How can he be? He's unjust. He abuses his position of power. And that's, again, where I said, if you were to look at the ten speeches of Job after the prologue, you'll know. He's angry at God. He doesn't believe God is loving and just. Because, as I've already said tonight, God abuses his omnipotence and his omniscience, and God ignores the prosperity of the wicked. Instead, picks on me, on me. I'm a good person. I'm innocent. God picks on me. What do you do if you believe that suffering is the message of the book? Then you, you, you're stuck. You don't know how to deal with chapters 38, 39, 40, and 41. Why doesn't God address suffering if this book is about suffering? Why doesn't God specifically address Job's situation? I mean, isn't that the elephant in the room? How does one, how does one deal with the speeches of the Lord if this book's about suffering? You won't like either way. One way to think about it is that God's a politician. Is God a politician? Oh, praise God, he's not. <laughs> you know, politicians never deal, I shouldn't say never, because some do. Most politicians, for the sake of approval rating, will not deal with what is controversial. They don't. They sidestep it. You ever heard them being interviewed? They don't answer the question. That's so frustrating. They don't answer the question. Or what do they do? They kick the issue uh, six months, a year, three years down the road after they're out of office living comfortably. Is that God? Of course that's not God. God is not a politician. God is not afraid to deal with the specifics of Job's life, and he is certainly not afraid to deal with the specifics of your life or my life. Thanks be to God. Right? Another way to, to, uh, to, to deal with the speeches of the Lord, if you think that this book is about suffering, is that God's irrelevant. Oh my goodness, is God irrelevant? Outdated? Not in touch? Of course not. You know, if we believe that this book is about suffering, we'd have to say, God, you had your opportunity and you swung and missed. God, you had the opportunity to hit it head on and, and resolve it for all time, but you didn't. Why? Did you really have some other things that you wanted to say so much that you failed to appreciate the significance of the moment? So I told you, you're not going to like either of those ways to resolve the speeches of the Lord if you insist that this book is about suffering, because it's not. It's part of the story. But it's not focused on suffering. Because I've done the research, and because I'd like to enlighten you, hey, I did all the work. You know, I, I, I didn't want to just get the degree. I wanted to help folks, so I'm, that's why I'm doing it. I, I love you. I'm helping you here. Okay, right. You're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> uh, when you look at all of the, the the scholars who write about the Book of Job who insist that suffering is the message, you know how they how they resolve the Yahweh speeches? No, they don't use the politician argument. That would undermine them. And they don't use the irrelevant argument because that would undermine them. So what do they do? That, because they've got it. They can't ignore the speeches of the Lord. This is the climax of the book. So y'all, there's three ways that Old Testament scholars who insist that this book is about suffering Three ways that they work through chapter 38 to 41. You ready? Here they are. 
I, I'll repeat them in case you want to take notes. I'll repeat them. Number one, God's presence was more important than what he said. So they focused on the proximity of the speaker and the speaker being God. God being there was absolutely enough. And God's presence was more important than what he said. Okay? A second way that these folks who just, they can't let it go. They, they, they just absolutely insist that this book is about suffering. The second way that they resolve that the Yahweh speeches is, is, is the following. That God spoke is more important than what he spoke. So the act of speaking, that God spoke is much more important than what God spoke. Finally, a third way that these folks insisting that this book is about suffering and God is certainly not irrelevant or a politician. A third way that they resolve this quandary is that what God says is a wonderful distraction or diversion from Job's pain. You know, kind of like if we're stressed, we, we might put some music on and, and it kind of takes our mind off of what's happening, what we're facing. And so that's what they're saying. That, hey, God speaking, uh, he, he really wasn't intending to, to, to deal with Job's questions. No, he just wanted to, to get Job's mind off of the pain. And so by listening to God just for a few minutes, you know, Job had peace. So speaking as a distraction or as a diversion. I want to respond quickly to each of those. Okay? So is it the proximity of the speaker, number one, that God's presence is more important than what he said? Here's my point. Here's my counter to that. Then why did God speak at all? Why, why speak at all, right? All he could do, in my opinion, if all that mattered was God's presence, God could have, could have shown up he would have put his arms around Job and said simply, quickly, Job, I'm here. I love you. Why speak for 126 verses? Okay. Here's my counter to the second. That God spoke is more important than what he spoke. Once again, my, my response to that is why speak two speeches that are very detailed? Why? Why? Because they are detailed. It's not just gobbledygook. It's very precise, well-spoken speeches. If, if what mattered was that God talked, just talk about anything. Talk about the weather. Talk about, talk about sports. I don't know. Talk about something. You don't have to be this organized and this detailed in a response if, if all that matters is that you just say something. Just, just voice syllables of words and just keep doing that. Here's my counter to the third way to deal with the speeches of the Lord. My counter is this. Oh, you know, speaking by God was just a d distraction or a diversion. My counter to that is God being omnipotent and omniscient is absolutely capable of dealing head on with Job. He doesn't have to provide a distraction or a diversion. That's a weak sometimes do because that's all we can do. God can do a whole lot more than that. So I'm saying to you, God is absolutely capable of doing much more than just diverting and distracting Job. Okay. So now, did Job get what he wanted? Answer, no. Did Job get what he needed? Ah, that's a different question. And the answer you be the judge. Listen. Yeah, I'm getting ahead of myself. This is this is for two weeks from now. Two weeks from now. Listen to Job's second response. Job's response to the second speech of the Lord. Chapter 42. Verse 1. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that thou canst do all things, and that no purpose of thine can be thwarted. Who is this that 
hides counsel without knowledge. Therefore, I have declared that which I did not understand. Things, what? Too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Hear now, and I will speak. I will ask thee, and do thou instruct me. I've heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes sees thee. Therefore, I retract, and I repent in dust and ashes. Sounds satisfied to me. Job didn't get what he wanted. Job got what he needed. Isn't that always true? It's true about my life. I look back and I think, boy, I really wanted that. I thought I needed that. And even prayed about it passionately. And God was smart enough not to give it to me. Yeah, the country singer Garth Brooks saying, thank God for unanswered prayers. Yes. Because I'm living proof of examples of, I didn't know what I was praying about. I did what I thought was, the Lord told me to do, was pray and pray specifically, so I did, and, and, and I'm glad he didn't answer my prayer, because I'd have been married three times before I met Mary Ann. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, I really thought that Debbie was the right one. Oh, yeah, I really did. Uh, then it was Laura, and, uh, and then it was that was Tracy, and it's like, oh well, you know, didn't have a clue what I was asking for, but I knew I was right, and I knew my need, and I'm so thankful God said with a smile, nope, wrong, wrong again, Ivan, wrong again. Y'all, aren't you glad about the following? God, being divine, being divine, are you ready? Is free. He's free. What does that mean? He's free to act <coughs> or not to act. He's free to speak or not to speak. Human demands and human time schedules, we've all got those schedules, do not hold God ever hostage. And the book of Job is proof. That God did not speak when Job wanted. And God <coughs> did not speak what Job wanted. I find that to be absolutely brilliant literature. That God did not speak <coughs> immediately after Job's impassioned oath of innocence in chapter 31. God didn't show up. Job didn't burn up. Remember, Elihu spoke instead, which reveals, again, before we even get to the speeches, God is sovereign. He cannot be coerced. He cannot be manipulated. The fact that I cannot manipulate or coerce God is good news for you all. The fact that you all can't manipulate and coerce God is good news for me. None of us can. We have these expressions, putting God in a box, sticking God on a string. Yeah, those are just pitiful attempts, but none, nobody has ever accomplished any of that. Why? He's God. Right. Now, before this truth alarms you, it's the truth that God is free. Before that truth alarms you, Remember another truth about this God who is free. He is the wonderful heavenly Father. Loving parents, and I'm looking at a lot of loving parents, and some really good grandparents, too. Okay, but let's just stick with parents for the moment, right? Loving parents, just like you are, are free to do what is best, for children and to give what is best for children. Good parents are not just puppets on a string or genies in a bottle. I think I already know the answer to the following question. If your kids had said, I want a hundred dollars now, I think I already know how you would have responded. I think I already know. 
I think I already know. If your kids yell, give the car keys to me pronto, I think I know how you would have responded. You may not have said theologically, I'm free. But that's what you did theologically. No, you, you were uh, the judge and jury, and they got in big trouble if that's, if that's what they did. Right? You're free. The same God who is free to act or not to act, free to answer or not to answer, promises us. And this is what Jesus said about our heavenly Father. Listen, just listen to Luke chapter 11, verses 11, 12, and 13. Now, Suppose one of you fathers is asked by his son for a fish. He will not give him a snake instead of a fish, will he? Or if he is asked for an egg, he will not give him a scorpion, will he? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? And my favorite verse, you've never asked what my favorite verse is, you know, that's, that's really a hard that's a hard question, isn't it? Because when we say my favorite verse, and then we give about 65 verses, right? <laughs> but if, if I had to be, uh, you know, uh, cornered and asked for one favorite verse, believe it or not, it's 1 John chapter 5, verse 14. 1 John chapter 5, verse 14. And this is the confidence that we have, that if we ask anything according to his will, he will hear us. I love that verse. This is the confidence that we have, that if we ask anything according to his will, he will hear us. Now, that's not just audible, you know, he's not just hearing the sound waves, but that's saying he responds. He responds. So, you may have heard it, and I forgive you if you ever said it, that oft-repeated saying, be careful what you pray for because God just might give it to you is not biblical, it's not theological. It isn't. I've already told you, I've asked for things. I have been, I've, I've named it and claimed it. And guess what? Nope. Not getting it. Not getting it. Why? Because he knows best. He's a loving Heavenly Father and he takes care of all his children. That's good news. Now, y'all keep praying. Keep praying. And let him sort it out. Let him sort it out. Uh, I, I, I would say to you, don't let that be a, a deterrent to your praying. Well, you know, I, I don't want to be wrong in my praying. Uh, you, you, we already know from Romans chapter 8, verse 26, that we don't know how to pray as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. We need to pray. So pray. And just trust because he's earned it. That how he responds to you is what is best for you. And that's a good reminder, whether you're a teenager wondering when does life begin, like I said this morning, or later in your, your lifetime. And, and we're still praying for things, aren't we? We'll be praying for things until we breathe our last or when, when he returns. It's good. You keep praying. That pleases him. That demonstrates that you trust him. And that matters to him. And that's what we need to do, is trust him. So, Job, you ready? He wanted answers. Do you know what he got? Once you read these two speeches, you find out he got questions. He got questions. God does his best. Alex Trebek. Does anyone know who Alex Trebek is? Of course, yes, the that's right. I'm hearing it. That's right. Uh, the Jeopardy hubs, right? So God, instead of giving Job answers, instead, rapid fire asks questions. 60 questions in the first speech. 60. Chapter 38, verse 1. To chapter 40, verse 2. And then, if that wasn't enough, 26 more questions in the second speech. Chapter 40, verse 6, and chapter 41, verse 34. 86 questions in all. Not what Job wanted, but exactly what 
you need it. Because God is being very gentle here. He's being the teacher. We might think, oh man, God's really uh, blitzing Job. Uh, you know, uh, making minced meat out of him, Swiss cheese out of him with these questions. I mean, what's God doing? He's trying to flaunt his his his, his, his ability as God, and, and he's just pulverizing Job, embarrassing Job? No, no. He, he's being instructional here. Job needs a little lesson, a little clarification, and God provides that in the, in the best way possible. It's not a scolding. It's a lecture, but not a lecture. Uh, let me tell you, that <coughs> it, it's really uh, a way for, for Job to think. Rethink. Uh, Y'all, I'm not as good as God, may I say, as a teacher. When you turn in your test to me, it's too late to change your answers. <laughs> is that not unfair? It's just not. You know, I, I, I know. It, it's, it's just not nice, is it? Once they turn the test in, it's too late. Now, I've had students, they come up to me with their test, and then they're like, as I go, hey, oh, hold on, hold on, I, I, I need to change something. Like, okay, you, you can change it now. You still have a moment to change it, but once you give it to me, it's too late. It's too late. What I love about God is that you can change your answer. He lets you. Are you sure, Job, that's your final answer? Are you sure? God gives us all the opportunity to change the answers. We can get it right. After getting it wrong, we can still get it right. What a God. Elliot. I like to comment they had about uh, God asking Job, would you discredit my justice? Then Job and his friends constantly defended God's justice. But Job simply wanted to see justice for him. God turned to David. He showed Job that he, like his friends, were using a theological argument in an improper fashion. He talked of the justice of God in order to prove the justice of Job. In so doing, he actually ended up claiming God was unjust. Such a claim was not necessary to prove Job's justice. Certainly God is just. In his wisdom, however, he does not choose to let us know all the evidence to prove his justice. We must trust him even when we do not understand his justice. Maybe it's something like that. When we don't understand God's plan, trust mm -hmm. the plan. Yes, right. Thank you. Is it that, that comes from your, is that from your study Bible? Yes. That's an excellent study Bible. I, I would agree with everything that you just read. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Now, we've got about five minutes to go. Here's what I'm, I'm, I'm going to do. In regards to this first speech, Y'all, there's a theme. You know what the theme is? Knowledge. The theme of the first speech is knowledge. And by means of these 60 questions, God kindly reminded Job, I know that you don't know. I know that you don't know. You think you know, but you don't know. Notice this theme, okay, as part of the questions. Just give you a sample in here, chapter 38, verse 2 and 3. Who is this, that God asks, that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Now gird up your loins like a man, and I will ask you, and you instruct me. Really? <laughs> okay, God, if I, that's what you want me to do, I quit. No, I'm not instructing you, but not Job. Look at verse 4, or listen to verse 4. 
Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Look at verse 18 of chapter 38. Have you understood the expanse of the earth? Tell me if you know all this. Verse 19 to 21. Where is the way to the dwelling of light? And darkness, where is its place? That you may take it to its territory, that you may discern the paths to its home. You know, for you were born man, and the number of your days is great. Verse 36. Who has put wisdom in the inmost being? Or has given understanding to the mind. You've got an outline of the book. And you've got an outline today of these speeches. Y'all, in this first speech, there's two parts. The theme is knowledge. And God is communicating gently by the question. I know, but you don't know, Joe. You think you know, but you don't know. So what we have in chapter 38, verse 1 to verse 38, we have a tour of creation. Various aspects of creation. A tour of creation. Then, in this first speech, though the theme is still knowledge, in chapter 38, verse 39, through chapter 40, verse 2. So from chapter 38, verse 39 to chapter 40, verse 2, Job, I call, gets a view of the zoo. Because then you have all of these animals that God talks about. Like chapter 39, verse 1 and 2. Chapter 39, verse 1 and 2. Do you know the time? The mountain goats give birth. Do you observe the calving of the deer? Can you count the months they fulfill? Or do you know the time they give birth? Verse 26, just one more example. Is it by your understanding that the hawk soars, stretching his wings toward the south? If you're wondering, and I hope you are, okay, all right, I've listened to you. And you just told me that the theme of this first speech is knowledge. And the questions are exposing that Job doesn't have the knowledge. And they are implying that God does. That Job doesn't really know what he thinks he knows. What's the point of all that? I'm so glad you asked that. So glad. Remember what the theme of the book, the message of the book is. It's God's sovereignty. God in control. Y'all, knowledge is a prerequisite for sovereignty. If you want to be in charge, if you want to be in control, you need knowledge. You do. And I'm being blunt, so excuse the bluntness. Dumb people don't make good leaders. Did, did you hear me say that? I said that it's, on, it's on the internet. Dumb people don't make good leaders. What's God saying? Joe, you question my position is God. I know. And I use my knowledge. Well. I take care of this creation. Places you've never been. I take care of the least of the creatures. Of this planet. That you don't even give a second thought about. I know. And I use my knowledge. Well. As I'm in charge. You know what? Jesus makes that same kind of, of argument for our assurance when he says, your heavenly father knows when even a sparrow falls to the ground. And aren't you worth much more than that sparrow? Have you thought about that? That our God is such a God of detail. And he cares about he cares about that, that, that dog. He cares about the squirrel that gets run over. He cares about all of that. And that's, that doesn't mean that he, he, he's distracted or he's, his eye is not on the ball. No, he is absolutely in touch and tune with your life. If he's that detailed to know about everything that happens, 
he also understands we matter more than any other part of this creation. We do. Now that's controversial today because you've got radical environmentalism which continues to brainwash our children and grandchildren, right? Such that you have folks that will say, we're a, we're a virus on this planet. This earth would be better off if human beings weren't on it. Sorry, God made this planet for us. And he assigned it to us to have dominion, to control it, to be fruitful and multiply on it. Everything that was made was made for us. And yes, I will agree, not with the radical environmentalists, but I will agree with the ecologists that we do need to be good stewards of that which God has entrusted to us. That's our job. Yes, absolutely. We take care of it because we're, we're only here for a, a, a time and then there's other generations that will inherit this. So yeah, we're supposed to be good stewards. But may we always remember we're the most important part of this creation. Jesus did not die for the blind-eyed salamander. He did not. Now, I'm not saying that go stomp on one tomorrow. I'm not saying the barbecue is spotted out next weekend. I'm not. But remember, he didn't die for the whale. He didn't die for the dolphin. He didn't die for the eagle. He loved us. And he loved us for the ultimate degree. Okay? So, hey, we've got through chapter 38, 39. But so we've got one more speech to go. And I'm telling you, even if you didn't do your homework, you still got time. When you do your homework, I want you to know in this second speech, especially in verses 9 through 14 of chapter 40, you will find what is unprecedented. Wow! I cannot believe what God says to Job in chapter 40, verses 9 through 14. But we'll deal with that. And if you're wondering, what's Behemoth and what's Leviathan? I'll take care of your curiosity next week. Let's pray. Father God, we're thankful that you are who you are. You're God. We're not. That was the first failing of, of humanity. When our ancestors, Adam and Eve, wanted to be like you in the ultimate sense. We thank you that you being God, you being God, are in absolute control. Not only are you capable, but you care. And because you care, you tell us to cast all our care upon you because you care about us. We need not work who's actually in charge of it all. It's not the mayoral council. It's not the state legislature. It's not Washington, D.C. It's not the United Nations. (coughs) No, you're in charge. And that gives us peace. We can rest at night. That you are for us and not against us. You who did not spare your own son, but delivered him up for us. How will you not also with him, Paul wrote, freely give us all things? And there's nothing that can separate us from your love. And you demonstrate that love over and over and over again. Thank you that you're above every demand. (laughs) That you can't be bribed, you can't be manipulated, you can't be coerced in any way. That's the reason why your will is good and acceptable and perfect for all of us not just a few because you don't cater to anyone and give preferential treatment to just one you are impartial, you are absolutely fair you are just as we have already discussed tonight even when we do not understand your justice help us to trust you in Christ's name we pray